this is what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Hello, everybody. Good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and thank you for joining to the, the final episode of our training series in spring. Uh, today we talk about large-scale geospatial analytics with graphs uh, in the, the Pi Data ecosystem, and I'm super happy to have former Neo4j colleague and now uh, masterminded Verobots Will Lyon with with us today. Hey, Will, how's it going? Good. Hey, Alex. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Good to see you. Good to see you too. It's been it's been a while. So yes, it's it's cool. Good to good to have you back on uh, on one of these episodes. Totally. Um, yeah. Uh, I before we dive in, uh, a couple of housekeeping keeping uh, items. Uh, we have uh, obviously the session uh, is on record, so you uh, will get a link to the slides. Uh, as well as to the video itself afterwards. So don't worry about it if you miss something, if something becomes not quite clear during the first run through. It could, you know, uh, we know, all know it can be sometimes a little bit quick uh, because of, um, you know, how, how it goes. And then if you want to recap on something, then you, you're totally uh, able to do so. The same goes for the slides. So you will have a, a, another, another go at them if you want to. Uh, there is a Q&A panel um, or the chat. So if you have any questions during the session, any comments, any anything that's unclear or maybe general uh, something that you don't want, don't want to, that you did, that don't sorry that you didn't understand but want to know more about, then please type away. Use the use the functionality. Uh, my dear uh, colleague Jennifer is also uh, on the line for Q and A, so she will be um, in in Q and A specifically for the for the session to help out with anything. If something is unclear, if something is not quite making sense to you, then uh, she will have a, an eye as well. And I see also Claire in chat. Uh, hi, Claire. Um, she will also hopefully. Uh, uh, give some some guidance if if possible. Uh, she's uh, also formerly of a J colleague, so she has a good good a good amount of experience. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think with that, uh, I think that's that's what I have to say. I will I will be in and out uh, every now and then for for uh, for questions for for uh, for when there's a break when it when the time allows. But yeah, um, I think we're ready to go, ready to kick it off. Uh, I I'm. You know, I wish you all good good time. Have uh, have uh, um, enjoyed the session, and uh, yeah, I'll see you um, when uh, when I see you. <laughs> Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, well, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the slides are available bit.ly slash near for j dash Sedona. Um, it just links to a Google Slides presentation. I would suggest you go ahead and, and open that up. Um, there'll be some some links and, and code sample that we're going to use throughout the workshop today. So maybe handy to just have that open uh, in a tab. So I guess the, the format today, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, go, go through a few slides, but really I want to spend most of the time hands on uh, using, uh, using various tooling. Um, we'll be Using a Python notebook, we'll be writing some uh, some SQL, <laughs> uh, some Cipher using using some near for J tooling. So it should be a fun session. Like Alex said, you know, definitely I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. So please, uh, you know, ask your questions, make comments in the chat uh, as much as you like. So this session, I think, is is a little bit of a follow up to a session that. Uh, Alex and I did in October that was looking at spatial functionality in Neo4j. And, and so we looked at things like uh, routing, graph algorithms, visualization, all in the context of geospatial data. And I think one thing we, we didn't really touch on much in that workshop was how do we use Neo4j along with other tools in the geospatial ecosystem. Um, and so specifically some of the tools in Python uh, and you know, some of them maybe more like cloud native geospatial tooling, uh, which is what we're gonna focus on today. So with that, um, let's, let's get into it. So if you don't know me, my, my name's Will. Uh, I work on the developer relations team at a company called Wearobots. We'll talk a bit about what, what Wearobots is and, and what we're building 
but like Alex said, I, I did work at Neo4j for a while, uh, for a number of years uh, uh, before Whereabots. Um, so there's some uh, some links to my various contact points. Feel free to, to connect and reach out uh, if you have any questions or want to chat about anything. Uh, and then again, there's the links to the slide, bit.ly, neo4j dash Sedona. So Apache Sedona, which we're going to be using today, is an open source project that adds spatial functionality to some of the uh, distributed compute frameworks that we may be familiar with in, in the terms of working with uh, data at scale. So things like um, Apache Spark, Databricks, Snowflake, um, those tools are great for working with large scale data, but out of the box, they lack native support for uh, a lot of spatial functionality. Uh, and so Apache Sedona sort of extends those uh, compute frameworks to add native geospatial types, optimizations for working with large scale data. So things like indexing, partitioning in the context of a distributed system. Uh, and the typical interface for working with geospatial data in these systems is spatial SQL. So sort of extensions to SQL that add functions and functionality specifically for working with geospatial data. Uh, and at Whereabots, Whereabots is the company that was founded by the creators uh, and core committers of Apache Sedona. And so at Whereabots, we're building or have built uh, a cloud solution that manages the infrastructure needed to work with geospatial data at scale. So think of managing uh, your Spark cluster, managing Apache Sedona on top of that. Uh, and other tooling that makes it easier to use in the cloud, integrating with more uh, sort of the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, and this is a, a tool that we're going to use today uh, alongside Neo4j Aura. So we're going to use uh, Whereabots Cloud to manage our Sedona instance, do some geospatial analysis, and then connect that to Neo4j Aura to do some graph analysis. So here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges and, and some examples of geospatial analytics, because I, I think there's some interesting things that may be a little bit different from other types of analytic systems that we're familiar with. We'll review a little bit of the spatial functionality in Neo4j. Uh, and then, like I said, most of today, I would like to be hands-on, really, in, in the tooling working with uh, Sedona in Whereabouts Cloud and then uh, in Near J Aura. Uh, we're going to be working with both uh, vector and, and raster data. Um, if you don't know what those are, that's that's fine. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to use uh, Python tooling. So the the Near J driver uh, for Python. We're, we're going to work in a hosted Jupyter Python environment in Whereabouts Cloud. Uh, and then we'll also see some interesting things going on in kind of this cloud native geospatial ecosystem. So we'll talk about things like GeoParquet, table formats, Apache Iceberg, these sorts of things as well. So at a, at a high level, this is kind of the, the architecture uh, of what we're working with today. So we're going to start uh, working with geospatial data in Whereabouts Cloud, in this Jupyter Notebook environment that's running on top of a distributed compute framework like uh, Apache Spark. Um, so we're going to analyze some data. And specifically, what, what we're going to look at are uh, uh, species observations. So we have some, some data about uh, bird species. We're going to build an interaction graph from our like individual point observation of these species to try to understand what species share range that ranges that overlap? How are they interacting? And this can have important implications for things like conservation, ecology, uh, these sorts of things. But we'll take a look at some other uh, other examples and other data sets uh, as well. And then um, once we build that that sort of um, species interaction graph, we'll load that into Neo4j Aura and do some uh, some graph queries and graph analytics with Neo4j. 
So let's talk a little bit about this idea of geospatial analytics. Um, rather than, than kind of saying you know, what it is, I think it's interesting to talk through some examples to give us an idea of kind of what's, what's possible, what's needed, uh, what are the, the tools in this ecosystem. So if we think about real estate um, and, and real estate data and some of the problems uh, that we're trying to solve in the real estate space, this can be things like site selection, where do I build my next store location if I'm managing a, an empire of, of uh, retail stores or maybe investment opportunities? How do I want to allocate resources or urban planning? How can I you know, identify areas that uh, need more infrastructure development? And these sorts of things are some of the problems that need to be solved. When you think of the data that's required for that, well, that's things like parcel data, um, building footprint data, looking at, at traffic, mobility data, um, floodplain, weather patterns, uh, road networks, all, all of this sort of data needs to come together uh, to help us answer the questions necessary to, to solve these problems. Um, and so one example might be for analyzing uh, investment opportunities in certain areas, we may want to calculate something that's known as an infill metric. Uh, so this is a, a common metric used in real estate analysis to determine sort of of all the parcels in an area, what percentage are covered by the footprints of buildings. And this infill metric, this gives us an indication of, okay, if we wanted to expand the buildings on each parcel, roughly in, in a neighborhood, you know, how much space is there to be able to do that? And the, the data that's used by the, it's used for this type of analysis include building footprint, which can often be derived from satellite imagery. So uh, looking at satellite images, calculating building footprints, and then overlaying that on to parcel data. Uh, and then doing that at scale, that's quite a lot of data that, that we're working with. Uh, risk analysis, this is another I think, really interesting area where there's a, a lot of geospatial analytics applications. So we can look at things like uh, disasters, natural disasters, also thinking about geopolitical risk, um, you know, risk of wildfire, flooding, uh, in uh, you know, pricing risk for insurance and financial services. Uh, so the example uh, in the center there, that's looking at uh, combining wildfire risk with climate anomalies to give us an indication of zip code areas that have a high risk of wildfire, um, understanding geopolitical risk. This is, this is uh, also becoming an, an interesting area where we're even sort of maybe combining the two, geopolitical risk plus the risk of national natural disasters. Uh, ecology, this is uh, also an interesting area where there are lots of applications of geospatial analytics. So understanding migration patterns, species interactions, that's specifically what, what we're gonna look at today. So that should be uh, a fun one. But also things like how does human infrastructure uh, impact wildlife, these sorts of things. The image on the right, this comes from a really interesting project called the Global Fishing Watch, which is a nonprofit that does lots of really interesting uh, machine learning work with uh, satellite imagery and other geospatial analytics to try to make sense of what's going on in the world's oceans. And this project specifically, they use satellite imagery and a machine learning model to identify fishing vessels and um, also offshore transport vessels so like oil, uh, as well as offshore stationary infrastructure. So things like oil platforms, uh, wind farms, these sorts of things and then tracked transport between the offshore infrastructure and then also tried to match the satellite identified vessels with the uh, AIS system, which is the automated system for publicly tracking fishing vessels or really any sort of vessels at sea. Uh, and what they found was really interesting that I think it's something like 70% of fishing vessels we're not reporting their location to the AIS systems. So that could be indication of possible illicit fishing or illicit activity uh, where those ships are not properly reporting their location uh, as required. 
So if you think of the, the data involved in that, lots and lots of uh, satellite imagery, but also time series. So uh, tracking movements over time across scenes uh, with satellite imagery, applying machine learning models to that. Telecom, so cell tower analysis, uh, where are we going to place new towers? Uh, how does population and population changes impact that? You can think of the, the types of data needed here. So call detail records, um, again, building footprints, traffic movement migration, uh, population comes into play here as well. Transportation and logistics. Uh, the, these images, these are kind of fun. These are from uh, the 30 day map challenge. So not necessarily the type of real world transportation and logistics problems that we, we want to solve. One is hunting for a, a Christmas tree in the woods, but um, you get the idea of you know, how are traffic and residential uh, patterns changing daily, um, similar to risk analysis, right? Like what routes are, are the most disaster prone, efficient routing, especially uh, efficient routing in the face of impacts to road networks perhaps uh, and disruptions there. This uh, blog post, I think, is an interesting look at kind of the, the breadth of some of the challenges, tooling, and approaches that are involved in spatial analysis. Um, so if you want to get kind of just a, a high-level overview of lots of the different approaches, the challenges, um, I think this is a, a, good, uh, a good place to start. And, and it's put into this nice periodic table, so it gives us kind of a you know, a, a broad overview of what all is involved. So let's talk about some of the, the challenges here, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, hands-on session in a second here. So there's this saying that uh, spatial is special, and that some of the, the challenges and, and the tooling are, are kind of unique to geospatial analysis. Um, and I think this this idea that, that that spatial is special comes from, you know, some of the perhaps unique data formats, data types, indexing, and, and partitioning systems that are unique to working with spatial data. Uh, so we'll talk through um, some of these. So first of all, uh, geospatial data formats. So at a at a high level, we we have raster data and vector data when we're working with spatial data types. So vector, these, these data are things like geometries. So points, lines, polygons that represent maybe point of interest, the boundary of a country, uh, a road network perhaps. Uh, so those are the geometries. And then there are associated attributes. So like the name of the, the point of interest, the name of the streets, the, population uh, or the uh, name of a country, the political boundaries, these sorts of things. And then we have raster data. Uh, and raster data is all about cells. Uh, cells and, and bands are the values. So every cell, uh, you get this as like a uh, satellite image, perhaps. This is kind of a common uh, type of raster data that we work with, where it's gridded up into cells or pixels, uh, and every cell has a value. If this is satellite imagery, the value is going to be maybe um, a spectrum, a spectral value. So red, green, blue, those are the bands. We have a red band, green, blue uh, bands as well. And we have a value associated uh, with each band in each cell. Now, raster data doesn't need to be just imagery or, or satellite imagery. Uh, we'll also commonly see things like weather models, uh, even population uh, distributed as raster data, uh, where each cell represents the you know, perhaps average temperature or population uh, within that area covered by that cell. So each cell refers to a specific area on the, the surface of the Earth. So geospatial data types, uh, points, lines, polygons. Uh, here we're showing the well-known text representation of these different data types, which is a, a common way to represent those. 
Uh, point line polygon, I think, are, are, are fairly straightforward. But then we start thinking about, OK, well, what if we have a, a polygon with a hole in it? Uh, what if we have multiple polygons that, uh, that sort of make up one object? Um, then things get a little more complicated. Uh, but point line polygon, those are the, the basic building blocks of our uh, geospatial data types. We have some uh, indexing systems that are a bit unique for geospatial as well. So things like GeoHash, S2, uh, and H3, which are, um, are interesting. Uh, so, so indexes are useful for things like uh, making database lookups faster or for partitioning data in uh, a partitioned file storage, right? So we're gonna talk about GeoParquet uh, in a little bit here and uh, partitioning GeoParquet is typically done by using an index value. Uh, also for aggregations, right? If we want to sort of summarize or visualize uh, aggregates of data, we can do this using uh, geospatial indexes. I won't say, say too much about this. Um, to, to, to save time here, but I do think that uh, it's important to understand some of the approaches for geospatial indexing uh, and some of the drawbacks and trade-offs. So for example, uh, GeoHash, this I think is one of the, the earlier and, and more common forms of geospatial indexing, which essentially uh, subdivides the surface of the earth and you know, asks the question, is your geometry on the left or the right? It's on the right. That gets, uh, that gets a one and then you subdivide again and again in this sort of nested structure until we have sort of the, the most fine grained um, cell that contains your geometry. Uh, and then that's converted to a string. One of the drawbacks though with the GeoHash is that it uses this um, Z order curve to, uh, to sort of, represent the string values here. And so you, what you see here is like this jump from seven to eight, which means that you can have an, an index value that is very close together. Eight is very close to seven, but geographically those are, those are not quite so close together. Uh, and so to overcome that uh, challenge and, and some of the others with GeoHash, the S2 indexing system was created, which uses a Hilbert curve and a, a different projection so that we don't have these jumps. You can see the Hilbert space filling curve uh, is much more, um, much more closely contained for each neighbor than the Z order curve, which is kind of jumping all over the place. Uh, and then H3, H3 is an indexing system based on hexagons with uh, the main observation that for, uh, for a tessellation. So if we take a bunch of hexagons and, and stick them together to cover a surface, the centroid of each neighboring hexagon is equidistant. Uh, and this simplifies some sort of map algebra operations. Uh, it's not the case for uh, squares, triangles, or other, other geometries. And then another challenge, especially when we're working in distributed systems, is this challenge of geospatial partitioning. So in a distributed system, we typically want to distribute pieces of our data somewhat evenly throughout the cluster so that we can, as we're doing analysis, we can make efficient use of our infrastructure. However, if we were to just use spatial proximity to distribute our data you know, throughout a cluster, we're going to end up with hotspots, right? So like New York uh, compared to, I don't know, maybe Montana, like whatever it is we're measuring in New York, we're probably gonna have more of it than we are in Montana. So if we just simply put all of the New York data uh, on one node in our cluster, we're gonna end up with, uh, with a hotspot there. So we need to be a little bit smarter about how we think about geospatial partitioning uh, in the context of a, of a distributed system. So if we think about the, the geospatial data ecosystem, these are, are some of the tools out there that we might be using 
Um, so things like QGIS and, and ArcGIS, these are GIS commonly like desktop um, UI driven interfaces. A lot of functioning is built on top of tools like GDAL, which have a lot of uh, functionality for converting data from one format to another, um, transforming data based on different um, coordinate reference systems, um, different projections, these sorts of things. PostGIS is an extension to the Postgres database, which adds native spatial functionality, uh, spatial types, uh, and supports spatial SQL uh, as well. Um, if we compare that to a system like Apache Sedona, where Apache Sedona is built on top of distributed compute framework like Spark, I guess the, the, the biggest difference is with PostGIS, you're working with Postgres, which is a system optimized for transactional use cases, so a transactional database uh, where you're inserting data in, into a table and, and you're inserting that into sort of the Postgres format. Whereas tools like Sedona that are optimized for analytics in a distributed system, uh, oftentimes you're following this more cloud native approach of bringing compute to the data. So rather than thinking of like inserting data into a database and, and moving the data around, we're loading it from maybe like cloud object storage uh, and sort of bringing the, the compute to the data without moving a lot of data around or more cloud native approach. And then in the Python ecosystem, uh, we have tools like GeoPandas, which add spatial functionality to uh, Pandas data frames, uh, and packages like Shapely for working with geometries, um, and Rasterio, which is uh, commonly used for, uh, for working with raster data, which we will, um, we'll all see in a little bit here. So let's talk a little bit about Sedona, and then uh, and then we're going to spin up our Whereabots Cloud instance and, and get started in the notebook here. So Sedona, we said, is this this open source project that adds spatial functionality to distributed compute frameworks like Spark or Snowflake, uh, and really introduces native spatial types. So when we're talking about points, lines, polygons, being able to work with those uh, in these systems as native types, native geometry uh, type. Uh, and then implementing some of those, those indexing and partitioning strategies that we talked about uh, a little bit ago, using spatial SQL. So using, um, using extensions to SQL that expose this geospatial functionality, both for vector and raster data uh, together. So if you think of the, the architecture of Sedona, there's the sort of spatial query processing layer that gives us the, the spatial SQL API. Uh, we can also work, work with you know, Python, Scala, Java, R as well. Uh, and then algorithms for you know, how to perform these operations in a, in a distributed system, uh, how to optimize queries uh, in a distributed system, Right. Think of like spatial joins, like the kind of optimizations you need to make when you're working with very large scale. Then at the uh, distributed spatial data sets layer, this is where spatial partitioning. So how do we uh, move data throughout our cluster? How do we index that data? Uh, and how do we compress that data through moving it back and forth with nodes in our, in our cluster? And then at the, the base, compute level of this are our distributed compute engines. So things like Spark, Flink, Snowflake, Databricks, these sorts of things. OK, so that was, um, that was enough of uh, slides for now. Let's jump in to our hands-on uh, hands session. So we're going to do two things here. One is we're going to spin up uh, a Whereabots, cl Whereabots Cloud instance. Um, so you can create a free account here Whereabots.services uh, is where we want to go to spin that up. Maybe um, we could put that in the in the chat for folks. Um, so if we go to Whereabots.services, um, create a free account. Um, you just have to do this by email. Uh, verify your email address, uh, and then uh, we'll ask you just to name to name an organization. Uh, Whereabots Cloud is, is set up so you can have multiple 
users uh, tied to an organization. So you can you can call your organization whatever you want, um, and then you can invite folks to it later on. But don't, I wouldn't worry about that for now. Uh, and then uh, once you get that far, you'll see this Whereabots Notebook uh, runtime configuration. And so the by default, the the free tier of Whereabots includes what's called the the Tiny or Sedona runtime, which is a, a small cluster. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and spin that up for today. And then we'll see this uh, open notebook button, which we'll click, and that will open up a Jupyter notebook environment where you'll see this your first Whereabots Cloud notebook. So I'll pause here for, uh, for a minute or two. Go ahead and create your Whereabots Cloud account. Again, it's free. There, there's no, um, no credit card or anything. We're just going to use the the free tier to get our uh, cluster up and running and, and get into the Jupyter environments. Um, and then we're going to pull in a Jupyter notebook that's kind of a skeleton of, of some code that we're going to run for today. Uh, so I'll pause here uh, for folks to go ahead and, and get that set up. And um, Alex, I don't know, maybe if, if there's any questions, we could maybe uh, take a few questions while we're waiting here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I. Uh, look out for questions, so you're welcome to type in uh, at any time. I see just uh, uh, a couple of folks who uh, said who they are and where they're from, so that was always interesting. So we have a couple of people from um, working with geospatial data. Owen here is from NCSU, Center for Geospatial Analytics. And we have um, Roger, who is from ArcGIS, who is an ArcGIS administrator and professional analyst uh, at um, uh, the Arctic space in the in the Arctic space. Yeah, so, so that's that's pretty cool. Uh, question from Benjamin: Are they the OGC standards WMS, WMTS, WFS in place to query data stored in Sedona? Yeah. So um, that, that, that's a great question. So the spatial SQL. Um, standard is, I think that there are a couple of different spatial SQL standards, right? There's the, the OGC standard and the, the MM3 standard um, that sort of define what these uh, spatial SQL functions should should look like. Um, and yes, like Sedona adheres to that um, to that standard, which is really is really I guess kind of a partial standard, right? So like that. Um, is in place for vector data in the context of spatial SQL. Um, for raster data, uh, spatial SQL standard doesn't really um, apply there. So um, some of the different implementations, I guess, of spatial SQL for handling raster data are perhaps um, perhaps a bit different. But yes, so to answer your question at a high level, yes, for um, for spatial SQL, Sedona adheres to that that OGC standard. Yeah. Cool. And then there's another question from Sharad. Uh, can we store Polygon data in the Neo4j database? So Neo4j, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, but the, I guess we'll talk about this a bit later, maybe. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that, that in a second. Neo4j supports um, point data, um, which we'll, we'll see how to work with. Um, and there's some workarounds, like you can store an array of points to represent a polygon. but Polygons are, are not natively supported in, in Neo4j. No, no. Okay. Another comment, uh, or more like uh, saying that who, who, who people are from Peter, he is at uh, Job Chis Consulting as a GOAI specialist and data scientist. So this is fully in his warehouse, he says. So yeah, it's great, great to have you here. Thank you all for joining uh, again. Uh, if there are questions, if there is anything you'd like to know more of, then please use the Q&A uh, functionality or just use chat. Um, somebody said it takes a minute to create uh, the notebook. So I think, um, yeah, uh, the startup time is a, is a bit, uh, uh, we, we have to take care of this. But I think, yeah, uh, I guess we have, uh, we have the time and I think we can probably continue slowly but steadily. Um, there's one more question from Vincent. Maybe we take this and then we, we continue. 
Is there a Docker or Kubernetes script to recreate Verobot's dev environment on a local machine? Yeah, so I think um, the slide might be hidden, but yeah. Um, so the just the previous slide here um, shows how to run the Apache Sedona Docker image. Um, and so if you run this, this will, this is good for like testing um, and, and local development. It'll spin up a, a Spark cluster uh, locally on your machine. You can configure resources to, to implement it. Um, so that's a good place to, uh, to start for running Apache Sedona locally. Um, definitely suggest for the, for the workshop today that we use um, Whereabots, because we're going to connect that to our, uh, our Near4j instance. So good to have things all sort of running in the cloud for us. Yeah. So yeah, great, great question. And maybe be, before we dive in, we take this one. Um, so to keep, so that everybody surely has time enough to set up their cloud. Um, from Eugene uh, says, loved the examples presented earlier. Can you recommend any books or resources on large scale geospatial analytics? Or is this something we cover at the end where you where you have like uh, summary and next uh, reading on material? Yeah, the I think the second to the last are very, if you're in the, the slides, the one of the last slide is a, sort of a resources um, slide. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, sort of books and examples that there's some workshops that we've done. I, I think there's um, like an interesting uh, workshop I did that looks at uh, Geoparquet, which, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is, which is sort of a, a great resource for digging into large scale uh, geospatial data. Um, the Whereabouts blog, we, we published a few things there as well. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll come to that at the end here. Cool. Great question. Thank you all. Uh, yeah. Um, but that I think we, everybody should be able, should be up to speed now where, where we want them to be. And I think we can uh, probably go ahead. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for asking those questions. Um, definitely, definitely keep them coming. Um, so hopefully you, you're all able to set up your whereabouts cloud accounts and then um, be sure to hit this uh, start button to start the notebook runtime. Um, and yeah, it may, it may take a moment or two for that to that to spin up. That's you know, spinning up a, a cluster behind the scenes. Um, I'll go ahead and, and show what that looks like. But just to give you an idea um, for those that are that are already in, where we're going next is we want to clone uh, in in the Jupyter environment. We want to clone uh, this, just copy it here. Uh, we want to clone this GitHub repository, um, which just has a notebook that we're going to start with. So within the Jupyter environment, if you go to File, New, Terminal, and then in the terminal, just copy and paste this git clone command. But let's see what this looks like. Um, so here's my Whereabouts Cloud account. I've already started. The, um, the Sedona runtime. So if, you, if you're signed in, you see something like this, then um, if you don't see this open notebook button, there's like a start button to start your runtime. So click that. So I'm gonna click open notebook and this is gonna open the Jupyter environment. Uh, and by default, you'll see this, uh, your first whereabouts cloud notebook. Um, so if you're not familiar, with Jupyter, Jupyter is kind of this, um, what do they call it? Like a, a literate code environment, I, I think is the term they use for it, where uh, I'm gonna I'll go ahead and click this, uh, this runs, it's gonna run all the cells here. But it's a sort of cell-based notebook environment where we have a mixture of code, content, um, and images that we can, uh, that we can embed. So, in this case, this uh, example notebook, this is showing uh, just how to run some basic examples using uh, the Whereabouts Open Data Catalog, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. But you can see here that we have a Python environment uh, and we're kind of mixing, zoom in a bit here too, so this is easier to see. 
uh, and we're kind of running uh, SQL statements within uh, the Sedona.SQL sort of Python uh, environment. Uh, and so what this example is doing, this is looking at uh, querying points of interest from the Overture maps uh, table in the Whereabouts Open Data Catalog to find hiking trails uh, near some point in San Francisco. So just, uh, and then visualizing that using uh, Sedona Kepler, which is like a Kepler GL integration. Um, so that, that's the basic, uh, the basic workflow um, is we have this Jupyter notebook environment. We can also uh, run this in, in Scala. Uh, we're gonna use uh, Python and, and Spatial SQL uh, today though. Cool. So the next thing uh, we want to do is clone the, the notebook that we're going to be running today. So I'm going to go to File, New, Terminal. Uh, and then I have a bunch of uh, direct, a bunch of things in here already. So you, you can do this uh, in a new folder or, or not, but I'm going to just create a new folder. I'm going to call this hands-on uh, and then run this git clone command. So that's going to clone uh, the Neo4j Whereabouts Workshop repository. And then if I go back to the file browser here, uh, and if I go back to the, the root, so if I click on this, this root directory, I created mine in uh, hands-on Neo4j Whereabouts Workshop. And then in this notebooks directory, there's a species interaction graph uh, ipython notebook um, let's go ahead and, uh, and open that and i'll put the the command back up on the screen it should also be in the chat too but uh, basically once you get the jupyter environment open file new terminal and then git clone at this url either copy from the copy, copy that command from the chat or if you're in the slides you can just copy it uh, here cool so one thing uh, one thing to note if you ran the uh, getting started notebook which eventually we'll end up with this visualization of, of hiking trails near San Francisco, just an example to, to get us started. Um, if you ran this, we'll need to go to the kernel and shut down the kernel. Um, one, one limitation of the, the tiny runtime is that we can only have one in the free tiers, we can only have one uh, notebook kernel running uh, at a time. So if you ran that, uh, be sure to, to shut that down before switching to the uh, notebook that we're going to use for the workshop here. So um, we'll be in be in this notebook for most of the next bit of the workshop here. Cool. So uh, in this notebook, this covers um, a few different things we're going to work with. Uh, we're going to import some data uh about bird species observations uh and then we're going to calculate the range of each species so uh sort of what's the extent of the area uh, where we've observed the species and then build a graph from that data to show how those species interact uh, which will be useful for studying things like conservation uh, and ecology so to start off, I'm going to go ahead and run uh, this slide, start a new kernel here, just to import our uh, dependencies. Uh, and then with, uh, with, with Sedona, you'll, you'll see a, uh, a cell like this for getting started, uh, just to, uh, to configure our Sedona context. And this is where we can do things like configure access credentials to um, cloud object storage buckets, these, these sorts of things. I think that, that's common, the, the most common configuration we'll see here, but it's where we can also configure uh, 
things within our Spark cluster, these sorts of things. We can also add this configuration uh, when we start the runtime in the UI. It's useful if you want to pass um, access credentials or, or environment variables um, from the UI that we don't want to check into code in our notebook, th those sorts of things. But I think the most common um, most common configuration is setting access credentials. And, and in this case, our data lives in this whereabouts examples S3 bucket. So we just, which is a public bucket, we just want to uh, set up anonymous AWS credentials uh, for that. Cool. So the data that we're going to use uh, initially comes from Bird Buddy. Uh, if you've if you've seen a, a few of my examples, you may, you may have seen me use Bird Buddy before. I, I really like this data set. Uh, so Bird Buddy, they make a smart bird feeder. So with some computer vision that can uh, that can identify the species of bird, and then if you have one of these feeders, you can choose to make the the location uh, public, and then Bird Buddy publishes some anonymized data uh, that has the sort of species, date, time, latitude, longitude uh, that you can download. Um, so I think this is a fun uh, a fun data set to use for uh, for examples and workshops. So that's what we're going to start with today. I've already grabbed uh, just like a month's worth of this data. Uh, and loaded it into uh, S3. So we're going to use Sedona's built-in CSV reader to load this data into a Sedona data frame. So we said that Sedona extends the functionality of distributed compute frameworks like Spark. So in, in the Spark ecosystem, we have a few different data structures. Um, an RDD or a resilient distributed data set, that, that's kind of the, the low level. And then on top of that, there's something called a Spark data frame. If you're familiar with like a, a pandas data frame in, in Python or I think data frames originally come from R, similar, similar concepts. Um, the, the difference is that in the Spark ecosystem, that data frame is distributed across, uh, across a cluster of, of machines. Um, so anyway, and, and, and then with Sedona, Sedona introduces this concept of a um, Sedona or spatial data frame that adds uh, native spatial types. So we introduce this concept of a geometry type that we can have in the data frame. Now, in this case, we loaded this data from a CSV file and we have uh, anonymized latitude and anonymized longitude fields, so separate fields, timestamp, common name, and, and the scientific name of the species. So what we need to do is cast the latitude and longitude fields into an actual geometry type, which we can do with the st point spatial SQL function. So like some of the, the docs here, um, st point is uh, a function that takes a latitude and longitude, um, or really an, an x and a y. Um, we're focused on geospatial data, which um, you know typically we think of, of longitude and latitude. But of course, there are, are many different coordinate reference systems. There are um, many different uh, units of measure, not just longitude and latitude, but that's what we're going to be focused on today. Uh, OK, so ST point uh, will take our longitude and latitude, give us an actual um, geometry, point geometry. Uh, and then also doing things like converting timestamp to an actual timestamp and, and these sorts of things. So now this BBDF data frame, we have location, which is an actual point geometry that represents the point where we observed uh, this species. We can do things like uh, like look at the schema of our table. It's it's fairly simple. Uh, we have nine and a half million observations, so not not a giant uh, amount of data. One thing I think that's that's nice um, about working with systems like like Spark and Sedona is that we can kind of use uh, you know 
smaller data sets for sort of training uh, and uh, development, and then sort of scale up so we could we could load uh, you know, all of the bird buddy data using the same approach um, and sort of see how scaling is applied. Uh, we can visualize data here. So Sedona Kepler, this is an integration with Kepler GL. Kepler GL is, is a great tool for visualizing uh, spatial data. And it allows us to observe, in this case, we're looking at just a sample of our, our 9 million observations, but we can see uh, where it was, the time that it occurred, the, the species name. We can also configure these so we can do things like um, uh, set the fill color to be based on uh, the species type. Let's pick a different color ramp here. You saw my, you saw my closet door move. That's my cat uh, escaping <laughs> from the closet. I'm gonna have to let her out in a minute here. Uh, right. So here we can we can get some idea that, that there are lots of different species types. This is perhaps not a super useful way to configure the visualization. We can also filter by by time. So if we go to filter, uh, because we have that timestamp field, filter by time or uh, even play an animation of how the observations uh, occurred over time. Uh, yeah, I ask a question, how do we get to the, the filter options? Yeah, so uh, if we click this arrow here uh, and then the first option is layers, and that's how we sort of can configure uh, the styling. Uh, and then the second one is filters. I just clicked on add filter and chose uh, timestamp. Cool, so that's Kepler GL. Um, the next thing we're going to do, let, me let my cat out. Jenny can be on camera, you can say hello to everyone. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. So the next thing uh, we want to do is for all of our species observations, right? So, so what we want to end up with is building this graph of species interactions. So where we know that the range of two species overlaps, then we, we're going to say that those two species uh, have an interaction, they have an overlapping range. And there's implications there for right things like conservation. So these, these species are sharing uh, the same habitat. There's also implications for maybe things like disease modeling, if, if we want to understand how you know, disease is spread through this uh, species interaction graph. Um, that can be a, an important, uh, important piece as well. So what we want to do is take these point observations and basically like draw a polygon around them. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use a technique called convex hull. So a, a, a convex hull really is like the smallest polygon that you can draw around a group of points to sort of enclose all the points in, in the polygon. Um, so in our, our spatial SQL query that we're gonna write in a minute here, we're basically going to do a group by species. So we get all of the points for a given species, draw a convex hull around those points, and then we'll end up with a polygon geometry, so a more complex geometry that represents the range, the extent uh, of where that species is observed. And of course, this is a, a simplification where we're, we're taking just a, a small subset of data. Um, so this is, you know, maybe not something that uh that you know ecologists uh, have a more complex way to uh, to represent this okay so 
I'm going to run this cell and we'll, we'll take a look at what uh, what we're doing here. So range DF. So we're going to, the result of this is going to be a new data frame, the result of this uh, SQL query. And then we uh, wrap this SQL statement in the Sedona.SQL. So Sedona.SQL. Uh, and here's our SQL statement. And the first thing we're going to do is select the common name, so the name of the species, uh, the count, so the number of observations of the species, and then st convex hull. So the spatial SQL functions start with st, that's for spatial temporal. So st underscore indicates that it's some uh, spatial functionality. And we're going to calculate convex hull. Well, what are we going to calculate that of? Well, we need to aggregate the location, so the geometry, the observation, the point geometry observations are the thing we're going to aggregate and then calculate convex hull of that grouped by species. And I have a, a predicate here. I'm just grabbing uh, maybe like 30 or, or, or so um, species just to kind of simplify our, our analysis here. Uh, oh, and I should also say these are coming from this view or, or table BB, which we created up here. We skipped over that part. Uh, we created here. So this is just creating a, a view or like a, like a namespace to refer to this data frame uh, that we created uh, in this line. So BB or since we're bird buddy. Okay, and so now we end up with a polygon for each species, uh, or at least the ones that we're filtering for uh, in our where clause here. So we can create a, a view for that. Oh, my keyboard died here. Restart my keyboard. There we go. Okay. Uh, and then we can visualize these ranges as well to give us an idea uh, for the species that we picked. Uh, we can look at the polygons and visualize those in uh, in Sedona Kepler. So Sedona Kepler, we can we can visualize um, one data frame. We can also pass multiple data frames. I think we'll see an example of that uh, in a moment. So let's style this. Go to uh, change the fill color to be based on the common name, and I'll choose a different color ramp. There we go. Okay, so we can see here, this gives us an idea of the ranges and, and how they kind of overlap a bit. So we have some, some pretty large ranges, so the Eastern Bluebird, uh, the Stellar's J, it's Finch, we have pretty large ranges. Some of, some of the others are, are quite small. Florida scrub jay is, is quite small range. This woodpecker has quite small range. So we can see how these ranges overlap. What we want to do next is sort of determine how these species uh, interact with each other, where we're saying an, an interaction we're defining as uh, these polygons, so the range of the species intersecting. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, we're gonna do that with spatial SQL again. Um, and this time we're gonna use the ST intersects uh, function. So ST intersects, it takes two geometries and returns true uh, if A intersects B. So we can use that in uh, in a where clause to determine for each uh, for each bird range um, what are all of the other species names that interact. So it's going to give us. We'll just go ahead and run this, and we'll see what it gives us. It's going to give us uh, a new table here where maybe let's. Let's say truncate equals false. That'll show the <clears throat> the whole 
table, which is or the expand, I guess, all the values and for each column, which can be hard to read, but gives a, a better idea of what exactly we're working with here. So for each species, so here's the acorn woodpecker. Um, we also calculated the centroid of its range using the st centroid function. But then uh, for each species, what are all of the other species whose range overlaps with uh, with the range of, in this case, the woodpecker? And then we do that for for each species. So the nuthatch. Here are the species that its range overlaps with, and we're using that to define an interaction. So we can say in this graph that we're going to build in a minute in the F4J, we can say that the brown-headed nuthatch interacts with the spot-breasted oriole, the Florida scrub jay, the wood thrush, because they share uh, habitat. Cool. And then we will uh, create a view for intersect so we can refer to that in our next statement. Okay, cool. So we've got this, uh, this data frame of species interactions and the centroid of, of each species. The next thing we want to do is load our data into Neo4j. Uh, and before we do that, we you know, typically start with defining the graph data model. So uh, how do we want to represent the data as a graph? Uh, if, we, if we go through this process, you know, I like to use this sort of iterative approach where I think about, okay, what are the, what are the entities? Um, those, are, those are my nodes. How are they uh, connected? Those are the relationships. Um, and then what describes them, what are the attributes, those are the properties. So our, our graph to start off with, we're gonna expand on this as we, we add some more data uh, from different sources. But initially we're gonna have this species interacts or uh, I call it range overlap. So one species has range overlap with another and the only uh, properties, only values here, we have the, the name of the species and the centroid, which is gonna be a point type. So um, the other thing I want to mention here is uh, the tool the tool that we can use to draw these graph data models is arrows, arrows.app, which is specifically designed for diagramming uh, these property graph models, which is quite useful. OK, so let's um, switch back to our slides and see if I missed anything. I don't think I did. I think. The next thing, oh, I did. I missed, you forgot to talk about spatial SQL. That's okay. We can go through um, spatial SQL pretty quick here, and then we'll talk a bit about Neo4j. So we saw some examples of uh, spatial SQL. We used, I think, the this st point function. Uh, we used the st intersects predicate. We use the uh, convex hull function. Um, in the spatial SQL functions, these are in, in Sedona. This, this is how the spatial functionality is exposed. Um, so think of these as like enhancements to, in this case, Spark SQL. So we have all the functionality of Spark SQL plus uh, these additional spatial SQL functions. Uh, and we haven't worked with it yet, but we also can work with raster data which we will in a moment here. And if, if we take a look at some examples, so if you're familiar with SQL, these will, these will make sense. If, you, if you're not familiar with SQL or uh, you haven't written SQL in a while, it might um, look a little foreign, but the basic structure of you know, your standard SQL statement is kind of like select from where. So select what, what fields do we want from, like what tables is the data coming from, and then where, what's our predicate. And we can use spatial SQL uh, functions typically in the, the select piece or in the where clause when we're defining a predicate. So there are 
I guess like three or four common uh, common types of queries that uh, Spatial SQL enable. The first is a spatial range query where uh, we maybe want to find all of the points within a polygon uh, or something like that. This example, this comes from the Global Fishing Watch uh, data sets that I, I mentioned at the beginning where we have uh, offshore infrastructure that's been identified by uh, satellite models. And in this case, I wanna find all of the offshore infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. So I just drew a simple uh, polygon to represent the Gulf of Mexico and use the um, ST within predicate functions so that takes two geometries uh, and returns true if one geometry is contained within the other. So if our points are within the polygon, and you can see here, um, we also use the ST geometry from WKT to create a geometry type from that well-known text format that we mentioned uh, earlier. If we have multiple tables with spatial data, we can do what's called a spatial join operation. So here we have uh, one table that represents airports, where we have point geometry, and another that represents uh, countries where we have uh, polygon geometry. We wanna join these two tables together to find uh, all airports in each country. And, and then we could do you know, maybe something like a, a group by aggregation to get a count and visualize uh, like a choropleth with the, the number of airports per country. Um, select from where? So what are we selecting? Well, the geometries uh, and the name of the airport, the name of the country from our country table, our airport table, and then where, so this is this is the piece where we're defining the join, join these tables where ST contains, so where one geometry contains another, where the uh, geometry of the country contains the geometry of the airport, point geometry. And one thing that, that's interesting to, to think about is because we're talking about working with data at scale, so, so a large amount of data, if you think of like the, the time complexity involved in working with this data, when you think of the type of indexing and partitioning that Sedona is doing for us behind the scenes to make these, uh, to make these queries efficient uh, is really where Sedona is adding a lot of value, right? Like we, we can't simply uh, go through and scan each point to see if each point is within this polygon, um, we need to have indexing and partitioning built behind the scenes to enable that query to be, uh, to be performant. We already saw an example of, of this next type of query, which is the, the spatial KNN or, or the K nearest neighbors. Um, so find hiking trails, um, find the closest hiking trails within some point in San Francisco. And again, think of, um, indexing and partitioning structures that we need to have in place that Sedona is optimizing for us in this case with large scale, uh, large scale data. Okay, so, so far we've been working with RAS, with uh, vector data. So uh, the geometries and so like points, lines, polygons, and their associated attributes, but we can also work with raster data, which we're going to, we're going to see in a minute here. So raster data, we said, is gridded data where we have cells uh, or pixels, and each cell has one or more values associated with it. Each cell represents some, uh, some piece of the surface of the Earth, right? So some geographic boundary. We have a like a spatial resolution for each cell. So in this case, uh, the height and width of each cell is one meter, which is uh, which is quite high resolution. So each each cell, each pixel represents one meter, one square meter of the Earth's surface. Uh, and we also have coordinates in, in pixel space, which map to uh, which map to coordinate space in uh, the coordinate reference system of our data. And then we can visualize that sort of by you know, translating the value of the pixel to 
uh, to some visual representation. If we have multiple bands like red, green, blue spectrum from a satellite image, we can uh, we can visualize those sort of as as we would an image. When we work with raster data in Sedona, we typically have a like a table format. So we have an Earth observation table, uh, perhaps where each row represents uh, a tile. So if we have large scale raster data, we typically want to tile those so that we can efficiently operate uh, on each tile. And then what, what can we do with raster data? Well, a, a common technique is of raster data manipulation is this idea of map algebra where we're performing some operation at the pixel level. So for each pixel, uh, we're maybe doing some calculation using multiple bands for that pixel or neighboring pixel, um, where we're calculating like a, like a vegetative index from a satellite image. This is useful for things like classifying land cover or, or, or things like that. Or if we have time series data, maybe we're looking at changes over time. And so this example, we have two years of average Earth surface temperature, so two rasters from, from two different years. And we're using this RS map algebra function to calculate the difference. So for each cell, um, for each pixel in our two different rasters, take the difference, uh, and that's going to show us the difference in average surface temperature uh, from one year to the next um, over the, the surface of the Earth. So at query time, we, we, we've talked about this a bit, uh, a bit before already, but kind of what are the different uh, pieces in, in the pipeline that happen? Uh, what are the optimizations that Sedona is adding? Well, first of all is, is you know, parsing the query, identifying the spatial expressions, identifying the geometry types, then optimizing that query. Um, so spatial filter pushdown is an important piece of this. Um, we'll talk about GeoParquet in, in a moment. This is uh, a cloud-native geospatial file format that can allow us to often push these filters down to the file storage layer. Uh, and if we can do that, we can, we can get better uh, performance out of our spatial queries. Um, function folding, if we have multiple um, predicates, perhaps, can we, can we sort of fold those into, um, into a more efficient query plan? Um, spatial join algorithm planning. So there are um, different approaches depending on how the data is distributed and, and what the data looks like for executing a spatial join. We have some optimization planning uh, in Sedona that uh, that takes care of that. Um, for spatial indexing uh, and data compression, so for things like executing um, spatial joins or uh, spatial queries, the way this works in Sedona is actually each instance in the cluster has its own local spatial index uh, to most efficiently execute um, that sort of piece of the query plan. And then this idea of spatial data compression is how can we um, how can we compress data to serialize it so as we're moving it uh, throughout the cluster we're doing that uh, we're doing that efficiently. Okay, cool. So that was a uh, spatial SQL introduction uh, that we skipped. We just sort of dived right into some examples in the notebook, but that's cool. Um, okay, so we we did the first piece of the notebook. Um, the next thing we need to do now, so we've, let's just go back to our notebook to review where we're at. Uh, so we imported our bird buddy data. We calculated the range of each species uh, using a convex hull operation. And we then looked at the ST intersects predicate to figure out, okay, all of the uh, species that are interacting based on where their ranges overlap. We have that in a table. 
We defined our graph model. So now we want to import this into Mu for J so we can analyze sort of how these uh, species are interacting in the graph. And to do that, we're going to use Mu for J Aura. So Mu for J Aura is Mu for J is cloud managed uh, service, which uh, which has a free tier. That we're going to make use of. Um, so if you sign in to Aura, newfj.com slash Aura, or that URL that Alex linked there, uh, and go ahead and create a free tier instance, uh, we're going to connect that to our Aurabots notebook environments uh, and import some data. Can we answer some questions before we do that? Absolutely. So while everybody gets gets ready, and if you haven't created your Aura instance, it's a, it's a good time to do it now. Uh, but there there were a couple of questions, um, and I think they most likely, or all of them, cover a little bit what you just showed earlier in the in the hands-on part as well as in the um, uh, SQL um, special. I would I would say um, maybe we go over them uh, briefly. Um, Sure. Benjamin asks, can we create a kind of materialized view in Spark Apache Sedona? Any advantages, disadvantages of using temp views like in the example? Yeah. So um, if we go back to our notebook. So the, the um, Data structures that we've talked about are like a data frame, so a Spark data frame. Um, so like this, this intersect DF um, is this kind of um, ephemeral in-memory data structure, um, and we we created a view for it called intersects. So intersects later on. Um, if I want to treat that as if it is a table in in, uh, in Sedona SQL, I can say you know select star from intersects. But really, what that's referring to is this in-memory data frame uh, object. And with with Spark, we're sort of setting up like a pipeline for each of these. So if I if I like refer to this view later on, Spark is typically going to go back and run this query to create that data frame in, in memory again. I, I can cache it so it's so it's available later on, these, these sorts of things. Um, that will typically have some some overhead, right? So I, I guess the way of the way of thinking about you know the Programming model in, in Spark is that we're you know kind of defining these like directed graphs of data processing, uh, and only when we refer to uh, some action that then materializes the uh, the data does that pipeline actually run. So like when we say intersect df dot show is when we're actually applying uh, this statement. Anyway, um, that was kind of a, a long setup to say that for sort of best type of query performance, uh, and this is related to kind of what we were talking about in uh, that pipeline of, of spatial SQL operations where um, so what are the optimizations that Sedona applies? And one of those is spatial filter pushdown. So what that means is that can we push the filter being applied down to the lowest level? Um, and the lowest level would be something like the, uh, the file storage layer. Uh, and I've hinted at this a few times, and, and we will talk about this to see where the benefit comes in. Uh, but if we can have the file storage layer using a file format like uh, GeoParquet, for example, where we can actually uh, push those spatial filters down to the file layer. So we can only, uh, instead of loading it into memory or, or only looking at uh, just a subset of the data using the spatial filter, 
um, that's going to give us the best um, the best performance. Um, anyway, that's kind of a, a roundabout uh, answer to the question, but that that I think is kind of what what you're getting at is like how do we get the best performance out of these spatial queries? The answer is to use um, spatial filter pushdown, um, and if we can use a file format like GeoParquet uh, to back that, then we're going to see the best performance. Cool, thank you. Uh, there's another one from Roger. Roger asks, so these are not pandas data frames. Common functions like lock and index don't seem to work on them. I think this is also about the, yeah. the notebooks. Yeah, yeah. the word data frame is, is really overloaded in, in the data science community, for sure. <laughs> um, pandas, pandas data frames in, in Python um, you know, are, are pretty common like in memory. Um, data set. The downside of, of a pandas data frame is that you have to load it in memory on a single machine. If you have very, very large scale data, if you don't have enough memory to do that on a single machine, then it's difficult to work with um, large scale data in pandas. The, the data frame that, that we're talking about in uh, this notebook are uh, Spark or, or Sedona data frames. Um, this is um, like a PySpark, Python Spark environment. Um, so it's similar to a, to a pandas data frame. And, and in a second, we're going to see how to convert a, a Sedona Spark data frame into a GeoPandas data frame. Um, so they're, they're similar, uh, I guess, conceptual model, but yeah, not, not exactly the same thing. Uh, and, and so like the advantage of the, the Spark data frame is that it's not just loaded into memory on one machine, it's distributed throughout a cluster. So I can do very large scale uh, spatial operations with it um, beyond what I can just do working with a pandas data frame in a single machine. Yeah, good observation there. Cool. And then maybe one more, and without going too much into raster algebra, uh, Adrian asks, if we have two data sets with different spatial resolution, do we need to resample the data to the bigger set scale, or is it done automatically? Yeah, so... Um, you would want to resample. Um, I think. I think it's a good question of whether they're whether that's handled automatically. I don't think so. I think you will need to um, explicitly resample. Um, and there's some examples in the documentation uh, of resampling uh, in the raster functions uh, section. Yeah, great question. And and spatial resolution, right? That's uh, basically referring to the size of each pixel. So when you're mm. doing map algebra operations. You want to be referring to that same uh, same piece of the surface of the Earth. So you want the spatial resolution to be the same. And resampling is basically taking uh, one raster data set with certain size of pixel and changing the size of the, the pixel, uh, or I should say the size of the surface of the Earth that each pixel represents. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Yeah, I think with that, um, we're ready to continue. I hope everybody is now ready and has their Aura instance set up. And yeah, let's, uh, let's go. Cool. Well, I better get my Aura instance set up. Um, so. We'll go ahead and spin that up. So we want to create a free instance and copy our password, download that. Um, so that, that downloads a text file that has our credentials um, as well. So while this is spinning up, um, let's quickly review. Uh, some Neo4j spatial functionality. So like I said um, at the beginning, this workshop is a little bit of, uh, of a review or a little bit of, a, of an extension of one we did in October that took a look at things like routing, um, graph data science, applied to geospatial data. Um, but I want to talk a bit about 
the spatial functionality that Neo4j supports um, out of the box. And because you may wonder, like, why why are we using Sedona, this different system? Um, are these you know the types of things that we can do in Neo4j? Uh, and you know, Neo4j is a graph database, so the spatial functionality that will we'll find available in Neo4j are kind of optimized for the, those kinds of graph workloads, not necessarily for the more general purpose um, geospatial functionality. Um, so this is the, the spatial cipher cheat sheet, which is a, a thing I created uh, a while ago that kind of touches on the spatial functionality built into Neo4j and, and a few different use cases. Um, so let's go through this really quick so we can just kind of see what working with spatial data in Neo4j looks like. Um, so there's a there's a blog post version of this as well. Oh yeah, we also did a, a video version of that. So let's take a look here. Um, Zoom in a bit. So the example that we have here is uh, looking at airport data, right? So we have airports connected by flights. And the, uh, the data type, the spatial data type that Neo4j supports is a specifically a point um, object. So we can uh, we can work with latitude and longitude, uh, so this is WGS eighty four uh, point objects, or we can also work with uh, Cartesian points as well. But for geospatial data, we want to work with um, units of latitude and longitude, so WGS eighty four um, to create a point. Um, so now this is a Cipher, which is near for JS query language. We can uh, explicitly create a point by using this point function. Uh, we can do that when we store properties. So here we're creating an airport node. So the parentheses indicate uh, a node. The A is a variable that we use to refer to that node later on. So we create the node and we set some properties on the node. Here we're explicitly creating a point. Uh, indexes are important for spatial lookup performance. So we, there's a specific type of index called a point index. And the spatial search operations that Neo4j supports are things like radius distance. So we can say uh, match on all airport nodes where point dot distance between two points, so between the airport node and between uh, some fixed point is less than uh, 20,000 meters, return all the airports in that radius distance. We can do that uh, also for bounding box, so point dot within B box. Uh, and these two operations will be, I should say, will be supported by a spatial index if we created that. Uh, right here. Um, geocoding is another uh, important feature that uh, Neo4j supports. So this is uh, translating description of a place to an actual point geometry. Uh, do this in the uh, in the APOC, uh, the APOC standard library, uh, sort of for Neo4j. Um, okay. Then this example shows how to uh, how to import data, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Um, also working with uh, with GeoJSON data, which we'll we'll take a look at in a moment. So I'm going to skip those. Um, routing, which we we covered a, I think a bit about routing in the October workshop. So I'll, I'll kind of skip over that. But just you know, understanding that there are uh, different graph uh, different pathfinding graph algorithms. Um, that allow you to find the, mo the most efficient uh, shortest path using different definitions of, of cost, these sorts of things. Um, talk about the Python driver, which, which we're going to use in a minute. So we'll skip over that. Um, working with GeoPandas, which we're going to look at in a minute. So I'll skip over that um, as well. One thing we're not going to look at 
um, today that uh, is interesting is this idea of working with OpenStreetMap data in Neo4j. So OpenStreetMap is really a graph model, right? We have this concept of, of nodes and, and groups of nodes that are, are connected to make up uh, features in OpenStreetMap. So I like to use the OSM in X Python package, uh, OSM for OpenStreetMap and in X for network X, which is a Python package for working with network data. Um, so here we, we've created uh, road networks and built a intersection or routing graph. One reason I like the OSM and X Python package is that it will simplify the topology of the network. Oftentimes we're interested just in the intersection to intersection graph. Uh, but if we import raw OpenStreetMap data, we get sort of all of the intermediate nodes and ways. Uh, but OSM and X will simplify that topology to give us just the intersection to intersection routing graph, uh, which we can import into Neo4j. Uh, and then visualize in uh, tools like Bloom. Cool, so that's um, that's a high level overview of, of some of the spatial functionality uh, available in Neo4j. Again, um, we look for the, the previous session that we ran um, a few months ago that goes into a, a bit more detail. Okay, cool. So it looks like our Neo4j Aura instance is up and running. So let's jump back to our notebook. And we talked about the data model uh, for the graph that we want to build. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is install the Neo4j Python driver and then import Neo4j uh, from the graph database namespace. Uh, and then we need to fill in our Aura credentials. So these are going to be specific to your Neo4j Aura instance. Um, so I copied the password in that uh, screen when you first create the Aura instance, uh, but it will it'll also force you to download a, a TXT file that has your credentials as well. So look for that TXT file that you downloaded. Uh, and then we also need the URI, how are we gonna connect to our Aura instance, which we can copy here, Let's zoom in, make this bigger, and copy right here, the connection URI. goes here. So again, don't use my values. These are going to be specific to your uh, Neo4j Aura instance. And so the Neo4j Python driver, there, there's a good overview that I linked here that shows how to get started, um, how we can connect to the database, write basic Cypher queries, uh, and then uh, how we can also run our own explicit transaction functions as well, which we're gonna do all of that right now. So here's kind of the, like the simplest approach here um, is to get a handle on the driver, we can verify connectivity, just kind of a, a test to make sure that our credentials work here. And then here's a, a simple cipher statement. So match in, it's gonna match all, all nodes. So the parentheses, indicate a node pattern. So find all nodes in the graph and return a count uh, of those. Then uh, that we get a records uh, collection, which you can iterate over and just print each rec record. This is only gonna return a single record, which in this case, uh, the num column, which is the only one that we're returning. Uh, is zero. That makes sense. This is a brand new database. There's there's no data in it. Uh, but let's fix that. Let's import uh, some data. So one thing, you know, because we're focused on looking at, or at least thinking about large scale data operations in this context. Um, so I want to introduce a pattern 
that we can use to batch operations by iterating over a data frame. And um, to do this, we're going to convert our intersect data frame. So we'll refresh our memories on what that looks like. That's this data structure. So it's fairly simple. We have three columns. We have common name, which is the name of a species. Uh, we have the centroid that represents uh, the centroid of the range of the species. And then we have this array of other species names. And these other species are those where the range of that species intersects with uh, this bird species. So what we can do uh, is iterate over chunks of that data frame. I mean, this, this example, it's, it's quite small. So we don't really need to do this. But if we had a much larger data frame, we wouldn't just want to send all of that data to Near4j at once in one, uh, in one Cypher statement. Because Near4j is a transactional database, we build up a uh, transaction state in memory. Uh, and we want to more efficiently manage our usage of the memory uh, in Near4j, which is why we can batch those. So what I'm going to do is convert our intersect Spark data frame uh, to a Geo data frame uh, using GeoPandas. So GeoPandas is uh, another one of these tools in the PyData geospatial ecosystem that extends pandas, so pandas data frame, by adding uh, spatial types and spatial functionality. So we can do uh, things like work with um, geometries in a column. We can uh, create uh, simple spatial filters, like find where two geometries intersect, these sorts of things using, uh, using the data frame sort of familiar API. But now we have this, this geo data frame, birds GDF. Uh, it has the same structure as our, our Spark data frame. And what we're going to do is uh, convert rows to geo JSON. So uh, if we call this to JSON function, that will convert uh, a uh, geodata frame, or in this case, just a slice of the geodata frame, just the first, uh, just the first row, to uh, GeoJSON. So GeoJSON is a file format that allows us to represent geospatial data in JSON. And the basic structure is that we have a geometry, uh, or I should say rather, we have uh, we have a feature at, at the high levels, so or, or groups of features um, that maps to each row here. So each row is a feature. And each feature has a geometry. In this case, it's a point geometry that has, uh, that has coordinates. And then we have the properties, uh, which in this case are like the common name of the species and the other uh, species that we intersect with. So what we're going to do is iterate over the geodata frame, convert uh, chunks of that to GeoJSON, and then pass that GeoJSON as a parameter in our Cypher query. So we need to define a, parameters, a parameterized Cypher query uh, that allows us to refer to pieces of this GeoJSON that define how we're going to create this graph in Near4j. Um, so we're going to pass um, like an array of GeoJSON as rows. So we're gonna unwind, so iterate over each row. And then we're gonna use a merge statement. So merge will, will sort of get or create, zoom in a bit, uh, get or create, so we'll avoid creating duplicates. Um, we, should, we should really create a constraint first, uh, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we won't need that here because we're, we're not really working with a ton of data, but typically we would create a constraint on uh, the species node on common name to avoid creating duplicates. Uh, then we're going to set the value of the centroid property. So we have uh, this point function here to create a point 
type in Neo4j. Then we're gonna need to unwind again to iterate over this array. So for all of the species that, uh, where the, their species range intersects with uh, the range of the species represented by this feature, we'll do another merge to get or create more uh, species nodes and then connect those with a range overlap uh, relationship. Okay, so that's gonna be the cipher query that defines uh, that defines how we're handling iterating over this GeoJSON. Um, insert data, this is a, a transaction function that's gonna sort of uh, take a look at how we can iterate over our geodata frame. And again, this is, this is a bit of overkill given the size of the data we're working with here, but this is a, a useful technique when we're working uh, with larger data sets that we want to import into Neo4j. The key piece, I guess, is here where we are uh, running the transaction, passing in the Cypher query, and then the, the parameters to the Cypher query are uh, basically converting the chunk of the geodata frame to GeoJSON uh, and then adding that in the rows uh, object here. And then to import the data, we'll instantiate um, our driver instance, verify connectivity, and then we'll execute this transaction function. And we did this just in one batch. We said batch size is 1,000. Well, we only had um, 362 things to create uh, in, in the database. So now, if we jump over to Aura, actually, let me copy my password for my Aura instance. So there's the password. We go to Aura. I'm going to click Open. And this will open uh, Neo4j workspace, which allows us to write uh, write queries and, and visualize the data. So I can say match species. So let's find all of the species nodes. I can kind of double click on those to expand the graph and see what species ranges overlap with others. I can also visualize these if I go to explore. And I'm going to say, show me uh, species that range overlap with species. So this is, uh, this is Neo4j Bloom, which is Neo4j's visualization and exploration tool. So I don't need to know Cypher um, to use this. I can just kind of write these natural language search uh, patterns, which is quite nice. Um, one thing that's nice also about Bloom is down here I can choose a coordinate layout. So because I'm working with spatial data, zoom back in a bit. So because I've stored the uh, centroid property, so the centroid of each range as a point geometry, I can lay out the nodes rather than like a typical force directed layout i can use that coordinate value uh, for how to lay those out so like down here one of these should probably be yeah here's our florida scrub jay so florida uh, sort of over here this is the california tohi so california is, is kind of over here so it gives us an idea you know roughly how these are laid out geographically but this also allows us to see you know sort of what species have maybe different types of centrality, right? So this Eastern bluebird, a lot of these species uh, only uh, interact or only over overlap ranges with the Eastern bluebird. So if we're looking at disease modeling, trying to uh, understand how disease spreads throughout our uh, graph of species, this could be kind of a, a key node, the Eastern bluebird um, species that could potentially be uh, we would say this has uh, high closeness centrality. Okay, cool. So that 
We have about 15 minutes left here. Um, let's jump back to our notebook to look at uh, a few different examples here. So we did our we did this import. Um, I want to take a look at how we can work with raster data. Um, I did have an exercise for writing some graph analytics queries, but let's let's skip that um, and we'll move on to taking a look at working with raster data. So we said earlier, seen this example a few times, raster data is based data based on grids and cells uh, and bands. Um, in this case, what would be what would make sense for working with raster data with our species uh, interaction graph? Well, one thing that's useful for raster data is distributing data about climate. Um, so we can use data from uh, this world climate, historical climate data set, uh, which has things like the uh, average temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, wind speed, these sorts of things, because it would be important to understand for each species what are attributes of their habitat, especially if we want to understand maybe how that is changing over time. That might have implications for uh, sort of the health of each species in the context of, uh, of our interaction graph here. So we're going to use the world climate data, specifically data about precipitation. And what we want to do is calculate the average annual precipitation in the range of each species. So to do that, we're going to use a technique called zonal statistics. So zonal statistics um, is really just about taking some vector data set, or taking some raster data set, rather, where we have uh, cells and grids and, and a value for each, for each cell, for each pixel. And then applying some geometry, often from a vector data set, where we overlay that on our grid. And then for all of the pixels that are within the bounds, uh, in, in this case, a municipal boundary, but in our example, it's going to be the bounds of the range of each species, the extent of the species. We're going to calculate um, some statistic. This could be a, a sum or an average, minimum, maximum, wh whatever kind of depends on, on the use case. Uh, but in our case, we're going to do this for precipitation to calculate average uh, annual precipitation uh, for the range of each species. So I've loaded the data set in S3 already. Um, these are GeoTIFFs. So TIFF is an image format. GeoTIFF extends that image format to add basically metadata uh, about the um, you know, sort of mapping of a cell to the surface of the Earth that it represents. So we can load GeoTIFFs in Sedona with this from GeoTIFF uh, spatial SQL function. And then uh, here we're going to execute a zonal statistic operation. Um, so we're using this RS zonal stats. And basically, this function takes a raster and a geometry. So the raster is the precipitation um, raster that I loaded here. And the geometry, this is from our ranges data frame that we calculated the range of each species. And then we want to say the statistic that we're calculating, we're going to calculate the average. So each cell represents um, precipitation amounts. We're going to take the average of that. Um, and then we have, we have 12 of these geotiffs. So I kind of skipped over that here, but we basically have one geotiff for each month, January through December. So I'm summing those values to give us the yearly average. Uh, and then we're grouping by the name of the species. And so what we end up with is uh, a data frame that has the name of the species, polygon that represents the, the range of the species, and then the uh, annual average precipitation for 
uh, for that range, for that geometry. And we can visualize that if we go into Kepler and tweak fill color to be based on yearly average precipitation and maybe something like that is the right uh, the right color scheme to use so we can see which which areas are a bit more a bit more rainy than others um, and again this is useful to understand you know the characteristics of the habitat especially if that's changing over time um, we can update this in near for j so we would have a annual precipitation property um, which we can use the similar approach to update that data in year for j um, so we're going to match on the species and set a new property of annual precipitation uh, and if we go back into aura we can we can do things like um, add rule-based styling to oh, i need to refresh the um, perspective to take this into account but we can do things like visualize the size of the node uh, to be based on you know how much precipitation um, that that range um, experiences for the the habitat. So the nodes are larger if the habitat has more precipitation, smaller if it has less precipitation be helpful for visualization. Um, okay, the last example here um, that I want to take a look at deals with uh, querying data from Overture Maps. So Overture Maps is a actually a Linux Foundation group that publishes free and open data related to uh, things like points of interest, land cover, uh, road transportation networks, uh, and this data is available in the Whereabouts Open Data Catalog. And the Open Data Catalog is really a, a series of tables. And so someone asked the question earlier of, you know, talk about the difference between like a materialized view and, and tables and, you know, what are the performance implications? And so this, this table, uh, in this case, this is the latest overture release, specifically the land use um, distribution. We can look at the geometry of this, and this maps with the this matches the um, Overture Maps schema. So if we look at the documentation, if you look at the themes, this is um, land use, which is one of their their base themes. So this is just the uh, following that schema that Overture distributes. Um, but one thing we can do here is search for national parks. So one thing we might want to understand related to conservation, you know, what are the protected areas within each uh, within each species range? And I'm just going to run this so we can visualize that and see what it looks like. But basically, what we're going to do here is within this table, uh, we're going to filter for uh, land use geometries that intersect the range of each species and where the class is national park. So basically for each species range, find the national parks in those species range. Um, and we get back uh, quite a few. So here's Alta Lake State Park, which is not a, not a national park. So maybe a little bit of distinction there, but we have all of the species where the range of that species intersects with the bounds of uh, this park uh, and it gives us uh, the polygon representation. So we found, and that's the polygon representation of, of the park specifically. So we have the, the bounds, not just like a point of interest for the park. So we found 2,000, um, 2,200 parks that intersect with the bounds of our uh, species here, which we can visualize in Sedona. Uh, Kepler, so the Kepler GL integration for Sedona. So previously, we were just visualizing a single data frame at a time, but we can also visualize multiple data frames in Sedona, uh, in Sedona Kepler. And that's what this 
looks like. So you can see here, we, we picked up quite a few uh, things that are not national parks. I mean, here's like, here's Yellowstone, um, Glacier National Park should be up here somewhere, but it looks like we picked up quite a few that, oh, here, here's Death Valley. Um, quite a few, especially in Canada, maybe like provincial parks would be more like a state park, but that's fine. That's um, protected land uh, as well. We can import that in, into Near4j. So that's the, the next piece here where we're adding a national park node uh, where the national park is within range of um, the species. But in the last couple of minutes we have, I wanna talk about the uh, interesting things that are underlying that table that we looked at, right? So like, what is what is this Sedona.table um, and what are the, the benefits of, of using that versus loading from a file, for example? So in this, this talk at um, the Phosphorg conference um, from a few years ago, Someone introduced, uh, Matthew Hansen introduced this idea of, you know, what are the, the pillars of cloud native geospatial analytics? And one of the things he talked about was scalable file access. And there are two interesting things going on, I think, in the, the cloud native geospatial world right now that are enabling um, you know, sort of scalable analytics at the, the file level, and that's GeoParquet and um, extensions to Iceberg for, uh, for table formats. So GeoParquet specifically is a file format um, that extends Apache Parquet and allows for efficient storage and retrieval of uh, geospatial data. Um, so really the, the goal is to introduce this very efficient file format for columnar geospatial workloads. So if, if you're familiar with Parquet, um, you know, Parquet is a columnar file format that implements lots of uh, compression and uh, efficient filter pushdown functionality. So for example, um, using the statistics uh, in the row, row level group, so the way that Parquet files are chunked, they're chunked into row groups. And so earlier on when I was talking about spatial filter pushdown and being able to push down the application of filtering in a spatial query, if we can push that down to the file storage layer, we're gonna have the best performance because we only have to look at a subset of the data. This is really what I meant here by using the statistics of um, row group or even the, the file metadata, if we have partitioned GeoParquet files, to being able to exclude um, pieces of data. So only zero in on the pieces of data that we're interested in. Um, so the slides here, we're, we're a bit out of time, so we'll skip over some of the specifics here, but that's that's really the uh, the important aspect here is being able to take advantage of the efficient storage and retrieval functionality built into Parquet by using um, GeoParquet for representing geospatial data. Um, so really uh, taking advantage of that. There's a uh, example, notebook here that shows some of the um, ways to use GeoParquet in Sedona. And then the Havasu table format. So when we were loading the Overture Maps land use data, um, that was loading from this file format called Havasu, which is an extension of Apache Iceberg, uh, which is a efficient way of working with sort of a table representation backed by in this case, uh, a bunch of GeoParquet files. So it gives us this very familiar SQL table interface for uh, querying and working with geospatial data, uh, being able to then efficiently um, store and retrieve data as GeoParquet. So we don't have to think about um, how we're storing, how we're partitioning our data as GeoParquet. The table formats uh, based on Apache Iceberg handles all of that, um, and this is called uh, Havasu. So when we're loading that table from uh, the Whereabouts Open Data Catalog, we're, we're loading a uh, Havasu, Havasu Iceberg table, uh, leveraging the benefit of that efficient partitioned GeoPK storage um, underneath it. And again, there's a, a notebook that uh, shows how to, uh, how to work with Havasu um, in Sedona. Cool, well, I think we're out of time. 
Um, I'll end here with just a link to, uh, to some resources uh, on the blog. We, we do publish some tutorials on YouTube, those sorts of things. Um, if you don't have the slides, you can uh, grab them here. Definitely feel free to reach out if you have any questions or, or want to chat. Always happy to chat with folks about uh, all things geospatial, really. Cool, super. Uh, that was great. Thank you very much, uh, Will, for for this for the for the you know, demo, especially for the hands-on part. Uh, great to follow through, I guess, and get some um, inspiration of how to work with, with geospatial data uh, potentially in the in the future. So, if you are in in um, in that space, I hope you. you you know, got something out of it and you, you found something interesting. Also for me, it was interesting to see all the different kinds of geospatial data formats there are now and how to work with the the, the different types uh, and how to interact with that. So that is uh, a cool space. Uh, I wasn't aware of uh, a thing called GeoTIFF. <laughs> so that's uh, pretty interesting. So um, so it's uh, it was cool uh, and uh, very good. So thank you very much for, uh, for this and thank you for uh, for the great uh, presentation today, Will. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for hosting and thanks everyone for joining, asking questions, following along. Great to see. Exactly. Perfect. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's just yeah, right, rightly so. Thank you for your for your time, all watching, uh, for your questions, for your comments, uh, and uh, thank you for for uh, yeah sticking around. Uh, this was, uh, as I said initially, the last uh, of the training series sessions uh, for this spring. What's next is um, next uh, Tuesday, the 2nd of April, um, 27th episode of Going Meta is happening on our YouTube uh, and LinkedIn channel. So if you are interested in uh, sticking around more, watch, watching more, then you can uh, subscribe to our LinkedIn or follow our YouTube channel for, for notifications on when that's happening. And when you are in the Neo4j space and want to know what's next, what to go now and what to do as a, as a kind of like follow up to this, uh, there's a couple of links here I put on the page, the community page, the Discord server, the Graph Academy with lots of uh, interesting courses to learn. Uh, and obviously Aura Free you saw already in this, uh, in this episode. So if you want to know more, if you want to learn, uh, then check out these resources and uh, and um, you know follow along. If you have any questions to this session, to anything else, then come by the community forum, the Discord server. Uh, the community there is is really helpful and really engaging. So if you have any questions, anything you'd like to discuss, then please come there and uh, and let us know what you're uh, working on, what you're struggling with, maybe or maybe help other users um, with their problems. And yeah, I think with that we are. At the end, thank you all for watching again. Thank you for your time. Thank you again, Will, for for uh, presenting and for um, the great um, demo today. And yeah, with that, I wish you a great rest of the week, uh, rest of the day. And uh, yeah, see you soon on another New4j live stream uh, conference or some other uh, meetup, maybe. Take care, everybody, and until next time.